If you're vulnerable to psychic damage from roguish language, stay away from these gibbering mouths. But if you intend on listening to this podcast about enriching your fantastical group hallucinations, you're too far gone already. We are the brothers, both DMs and players. I'm the one that casts Caffeine Boost Classic on my digestive system, Jordan. And I'm the one that casts Red Bull right into my veins, Travis. You junkie. <laughs> I'm probably going to die. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm planning for the end. <laughs> Start planning my <laughs> funeral now. Yep. Cast me away in a in one of those Red Bull freezers. And everyone gets a Red Bull in a to-go bag. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone wants to come to my wake because they are <laughs> jacked the fuck up. Playing some electronic music. <laughs> Welcome to the Hook and Chance podcast. Filling your bag of holding with rabbit ropers for incredible games. Well, that's a, that's a good one. That's That's a recipe for fun right there. Okay, so a little bit of housekeeping first. We had a Reddit post make some pretty good traction that featured the table that we play on regularly. There was a bunch of requests for plans to build those tables. So I think that that is the next big project is to try to digitize those plans. So I'm hard at work on that. The ideal would be to actually be able to host some of those plans directly on our website. So keep kind of checking around there or on our Patreon and they will eventually make their way there. One in every home. In Canada. <laughs> uh, I don't wish building that bastard <laughs> on anybody, yeah. but if you're brave enough to try, give her, because it's an awesome table. We play it on it. And, you know, just kind of like I think people say, hey, yeah, if you're uh, if you're buying a bed, spend the money because it's a third of your life. <laughs> Sa same goes for the table. It's a third of our life yeah, that we spend at that friggin' table. Today, what are we talking about? Well, this episode's about spell components, using them to greater effect. For anyone that's listening that doesn't know, spells in D&D &D are cast using a combination of three different components. We've got material components. These are the physical ingredients of the spell, and there's two types of those. You got your low cost. All of these, it's assumed that a caster has already, a wizard has, like a feather used to cast fly. And high cost. These usually have a fixed cost. And they're things that you got to actually go out and purchase. Like a child. In what way do you... <laughs> I don't want to play in your game if you're buying children <laughs> on the reg for spells. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need... Like, the, the spell I'm trying to cast is summon child. Oh. So you're just going to skip I need the spell? To, uh, no. <laughs> just buy one? <laughs> <laughs> no, because that's not casting a spell. That's just abduction. Okay. So you buy a kid... You use the kid to summon a different kid. Yes. A better kid. Yeah. Okay. Twice as strong. That sounds <laughs> that sounds wizardly. Okay. <laughs> or uh, like the rare and expensive oils that are used in a spell like reincarnate is another example of things you'd actually buy. What does that actually cost? That one is a thousand gold pieces worth of expensive oils. I mean, it is bringing someone back from the dead. Fair enough. What are you doing with those oils? Just give them the old rub down. <laughs> He'll rub it give up and scrub it corpse, up. The old rubby scrubby. <laughs> the other, the second part of all of those, then you move on to the verbal components. So verbal components would, of course, be some form of mystic words or a phrase that is uttered in order to allow a caster to kind of channel magical elements to their, their spell magic sounds <laughs> so you can't cast those spells with that if you're drowning or got a gag in your mouth or chewing on an apple or doing all three yeah that would suck <laughs> never eat apples underwater and then finally you've got somatic components and that's the weirdest word of the bunch which is physical gestures with your hands as wizards do the weaving and waving fiddling the old knuckle hams as they say <laughs> Casters do need a free hand to cast spells with this component. So I could do this part if I were drowning. Yes. There must not be very precise hand gestures because if you can do them underwater, then... I've been going to aquarobics three times a week preparing for this moment. Little known secret, 
all those people in aqua aerobics classes they're all casters they're <laughs> wizards supreme <laughs> <laughs> ethel beware of ethel she's a yeah that's what they're practicing yeah. there she got some serious BD. Ethel's a level on. 18 necromancy wizard <laughs> for sure. Some people like to play without delving too deep into these components, and that can be the way to go, especially if you want to just work on the basic rules or if you're working on the pace of gameplay. But some people are looking to get into it a little deeper, fiddle and tinker, like us. I think further to that point, regardless of whether or not you play a really in depth kind of role play style game, or you play primarily for the mechanics, there is a reason to get into this at least once in your game, even just to just introduce. Yeah, spells like any attacks can get really dry if you just say the title of them. Yeah, same thing every time. So we're going to start in our first segment, the Strategy Stateroom. We're going to put forth some ideas for making material components a little bit more of an interesting part of the game. Then we're going to jump over to the Archives of the Ancients, where we'll share some resources for players on making their own verbal components, adding dramatic flourish to spells. And then finally, in Timora's Tavern, Jordan and I are going to brain battle over some somatic spellcasting techniques and flavors. two casters to the table. All right, let's get started. This is the Strategy Stateroom where inventive and cunning tactics are crafted for when they're needed most. Okay, so to start this strategy stateroom off, my favorite DM tip is bonding the party by making expensive material components important. Now, I think this applies to both players and DMs, because if you're a player and you're a spellcaster, there are very expensive material components. And often these are kind of hand-waved because who really cares or... Takes away from the story or something like that. Yeah, uh, we don't want to have to try and go and track down these expensive components. And I think some do and some don't, but there's a pretty compelling argument to not doing it. However, the compelling argument for really paying attention to those kind of more expensive material components is not one person should necessarily have to bear the burden of that payment for buying these material components. And what that means is when the party tank goes down, the cleric has to step up and cast these really high-level spells. But if we're actually paying attention to those material components and how much they cost and having the entire party foot the bill for kind of that stuff, boy, when that person goes down, everyone else is far more invested yeah. in what happens in those battles. It's now not okay if a tank goes down. It's not just another long rest to bring somebody back to life. Exactly. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of important in order to really kind of bond that party together. And same thing goes for DMs. I mean, you can certainly suggest really paying attention to some of these material components, while players might not always be on board for acknowledging those material component costs, the long-term benefit is that, yeah, they'll essentially start to see the same things and they'll start to experience that going, oh my God, that spell costs so much to cast. Maybe I won't run straight at the troll. Exactly. We'll think a lot more strategically. We'll think... Yeah, a lot more weight to those decisions. And the whole team is there to boost each other up because if that tank goes down again, we're all going to be broke. Yeah, you don't just let him go down. That's our rent! (laughs) And I think this can also be a really great hook for any kind of weird side quests or adventures that you've got prepped or plotted and you don't know how to work it in. Throw an expensive pile of oil at the end of that cave guarded by a... Or maybe... Tree. (laughs) (laughs) That was a lot of buildup for not a lot of payoff. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But maybe the oils come from that tree and maybe it's a demon tree. Yes. Okay. Those are good. (laughs) Or it just gives a reason to haggle with unpleasant shopkeepers in town maybe the the party doesn't like having to go back to that oil seller because he's a real asshole and he slaps he, cats <laughs> he 
he slaps cats, but also he price gouges you. Yeah. And he's the only place in town that actually sells this oil in order to, or maybe end up owing him and the the person that you need to buy the diamond off of the thousand gold piece diamond is not wanting gold he's wanting something more or you make the unpleasant shopkeeper somebody that the party wronged on their way into town as Ooh. players are so want to do yep murder hoboed their <laughs> great cousin yeah well i've got a pretty juicy dm tip that i dug up as well Okay, lay it on me. I think it can be fantastic to reward the use of spell components on the first casting of the spell. So like rewarding a rich, detailed casting because that helps bring that spell to life so much in the moment and for all future castings. And if they go through their verbal component, their material and their somatic and get everybody all excited, then they can get advantage. A little bit of a homebrew rule, but you can give them advantage on that first casting because another huge part about the first casting of a spell, for me at least, is that I really want it to go off well so that I can kind of amaze the group and feel good about it. If the first casting of a spell doesn't work, I know this is kind of just me being in my head, but I feel a little punished. I feel like that spell is now on my shit list and I never want to cast it again. And then if I cast it, try casting it one more time at a crucial moment and it still doesn't work then I'll pretty much give it up. Yeah, as a player, if I've just gotten access to a brand new spell that I'm really excited for, I need it to go off. I need it to have an impact. I've thought of this really elaborate, very cool first casting description of my new spell. And then it fizzles and it doesn't do anything. And that's that's really going to choke things up and impact a player i think in the long term i think it's really useful for everybody at the table so that they can imagine those spells so much more vividly every time you cast it after that and you don't have to go into all those details again you just say the verbal component or you just do one little thing to remind them of that first casting and then it all comes back yeah i think if you spend a lot of time on a particularly awesome first description of a new spell you can then dial it back for every subsequent casting but people get the idea they're like oh i remember this description from last time this looks really freaking cool all right one final quick tip for this segment if you don't like the physical components that the book gives you i'd say just make up your own it's a detail that doesn't change anything about the gameplay but it can make your character more interesting it can make the spells more representative of who you've created Sometimes bat guano doesn't represent (laughs) your dragonborn (laughs) sorcerer supreme very well, which is a spell component. I can't think of a lot of reasons why I'm carrying around bat shit either. Every every character should have a pocket full of guano. (laughs) Don't reach into that pocket. It's full of bat (laughs) shit. All right. That's as good a place as any to move this along to our next segment. Let's hop into Archives of the Ancients. This is the Archives of the Ancients, where knowledge is unearthed to add wild insights to our world. All right, so now we're switching over to verbal components. One of the biggest issues that I have with verbal components is that I think I'm going to improv it so good at the table, I don't bother prepping it, and then I'm ready to cast this really cool spell, and I it comes out as something like Abracadinky Bottom. <laughs> it really does not have that same kind of theatrical punch that you're really thinking in yeah your brain. it really pulls everyone out of the moment when they think about dinky bottom <laughs> and it's never whatever i come up with in my head in the moment is never going to sound as good as real time that someone spent creating a language i think there's a lot of different ways that you can approach this so you can either take real languages which is fine but a lot of them have the problem that they don't really have that fantasy flair. And I think the only one that people tend to use is Latin. Yeah. And one of my other issues with taking from real languages is that I don't know if I'd be able to explain to somebody that actually spoke that language that I was using their language in a make-em-up make game. Yeah. 
that feels I'd borderline feel a little insensitive. Weird. Yeah. Yeah. Little your your language is so dumb sounding, I can use it as a fantasy. No. So yeah, it's kind of hard to to give them the real flair that they deserve. So what's the alternative? Well, there's a lot of amazing nerds out there that have gone through all of the effort to make up their own complete languages, usually for TV or movies, but people have posted that online for us to use for our D&D games. People with actual degrees in linguistics yeah, have gone true. ahead and made fantasy languages that are not currently used by any one particular creed on Earth, but they have the same gravity. They have the same rooting in real language rules yeah that they sound convincing and they sound meaty and and interesting they have a certain feel to them as a language because if you sat me down in a room by myself to create a language you give me even 10 years and the word butt's gonna be in there a lot <laughs> and <laughs> that's how you end up with kadinky bottom <laughs> yes okay so what's the what's the first you said you found a bunch of languages yeah let's run through some of them First one up is Dovasul. I already recognize that one, and that's from the four to five years that I spent saving the world as the Dragonborn. In Skyrim, but it's also the race in D&D. <laughs> <laughs> well, then it's easy to make that hop over to D&D, so... Exactly. So just a couple of details about this language. It was created by Adam Adamowitz. I believe that's how it's said. Yes, okay. Adam's in there twice. Adam Adamowitz. He was a Bethesda concept artist. Whose parents were absolute dicks. For naming him Adam Adamowitz. Sorry, Adam. Sorry, Adam. Sorry, Adam's parents. (laughs) (laughs) Probably shouldn't go around calling other people's parents dicks. (laughs) I'm sure they had a good reason. And just so that we can kind of hear how these sound, I went ahead and translated the spell fairy fire in all of these languages. Ooh. So here's your first translation. Goraviol. That's good. It sounds way cooler than Fairy Fire should sound. <laughs> That's true. I don't know. Fairy <laughs> Fire is pretty cool. Fairy Fire is pretty cool. Doesn't have to be super light and fancy free. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next one on our list is Navi. Ooh. You recognize that one? I do. Jimmy Cameron. Yep. He made a movie with some tall blue people in it and he called it Avatar. And they needed a language for that planet. It was created by Paul Frommer with an actual doctorate in linguistics. I'm sure James Cameron is want to do. Just find the foremost linguistics expert and have him make up a language yeah. for his film. That's pretty nuts, though. That's, that's dedication. And fiery fire in that language comes off as tepure. That's, that's my sound to it. Tepure. Taper. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's like that. I, I'm not Paul Frommer. Spelled T X E P apostrophe U R. So I don't know. You tell us how that one was pronounced. Yeah. We're probably going to butcher every one of these. Yeah, absolutely. All and right. I'm bu- going to butcher some names. So yeah, go ahead and email us in those how those sound, please. <laughs> and we'll get it right next time. Okay, so this next one, we are absolutely going to get some, some comments or some emails about. <laughs> Because I am certain we are not going to do this one justice, and there is absolutely a legion of people that are fluent in Elvish from Lord of the Rings. Oh, the classic. Do you know who created that one? <laughs> J.R.R. No, R. R. Tolkien. <laughs> the original. I. Yeah, he was into he was into short people and big people, <laughs> and, and telling them. really long stories. Uh, <laughs> All right, so fairy fire in that. Fairy menar. Ooh. You like that? Yeah. Do I sound like an elfman? Yeah, an elfman. All Moving right, and the on. next language we've got is we're going out to space for this one, Ewokies. I could see that taking on a bit of a fantasy, you know, high fantasy slant. Yeah, and I think it sounds a little bit different from all the languages covered so far. It's definitely unique in its wonderful, fun sounds. So who created this one? Ben Burt of Industrial Light and Magic Sound Design. Wow. So a sound designer, actually. He doesn't get the credit that Paul gets with that doctorate in linguistics, but still, good work. Good work, Ben. For creating Ewokies, <laughs> his shining achievement. I'm sure he's done other stuff. So what does Fairy Fire sound like in this one? Let me get in the right mind frame. <laughs> 
Ijoama. Ijoama. Zigzis fairy fire. Oh, very good. There we go. Jiyoonga fenga wa. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I've only seen the movie like once or twice. <laughs> the next language on the list is Dothraki from a more recent creation, Game of Thrones. That definitely deserves to make the list. Mm -hmm. And they went out to the Member of Language Creation Society, which apparently is a thing, and got David J. Peterson for the job. Sign me up. I want to be a part of a language creation society. Yeah, me That's too. Gnarly. That sounds cool. Fairy fire in that one. Okay, it's got to sound kind of intense and guttural for this one. Divorza. Yeah, that's that's some good shit right there. I'm a little scared. I'm a little scared of a horse lord outlining me in fairy magic. Heck yeah, centaurs casting fairy fire on you and then kicking you right in the face. That actually, that's pretty much what the Dothraki <laughs> were. They were like centaurs that could separate them their torso. <laughs> it's a bunch of cursed centaurs. Yeah, yeah. They're like, oh, <laughs> I get separated from my legs. <laughs> <laughs> having two legs sucks <laughs> um, and then we've got finally to top this list off a one of the oldest languages on this list and one of the most fleshed out comes from star trek is klingon so we're definitely going to piss some people off with this one absolutely like you can actually learn this language in so certain schools am i correct yes absolutely so yeah my apologies everybody my apologies to the creators Mark O'Crand, James Doohan, and John Pavel all work together for this one. I, you can find like intense translators out there. And like you said, you can actually learn this as a post-secondary language class. Yeah, which, which is, is wild. A cool world that we live in. <laughs> Absolutely. As well as becoming a Jedi. Okay. <laughs> but so what is what is uh, Fairy Fire sound like now, in Klingon? I don't even know how Klingon really sounds. Oh, no. Like cool. Yeah, no, that sounds pretty pretty close. Okay. Leg, leg, one more time. Leg cool. Yeah. Or should it be a leg cool? <laughs> Just for a more. So is that when the Klingon gets taken over by the Borg? <laughs> I, get, I don't even know what the Borg is. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> You're embarrassing us. I'm All sorry. right. <laughs> That's as good a spot as any before we keep messing up other <laughs> other fantasy languages so we're gonna post the links to those translators for each of those languages in our show notes so you can go ahead and make your own great spells yeah and definitely a step up from trying to butcher some other real language so give her you can go and butcher a fantasy yeah one like instead. i feel <laughs> way better butchering a fantasy language than i do about butchering a real one all so, right, on to our final segment, Timora's Tavern. Welcome to Timora's Tavern, where absurd games of fortune and skill are played for the amusement of all. Okay, time to flex some creative muscles, and mine are weak and flabby. So you've prepped this contest of wits, which yes. is three spells, and we've got kind of a narrative that we're walking through. And it's less of a contest of wits and more just two wizards side by side accomplishing a goal cooperatively as D&D &D do. And we're just showcasing two different styles that you could take with verbal and somatic spell casting. So your caster... Who is this caster? Well, I'm bringing to the table a mystical master McJaster, an accomplished <laughs> human wizard that wears a lucky pair of tight spandex casting shorts. That sounds like a you character for sure. Thank you very much. He's skinny and has a paunch. What are you, <laughs> <laughs> what are you bringing? Unnecessary details. <laughs> um, or entirely necessary details. I am bringing to the table... Mongrel Widemaw, oh. who is a half orc, he acts as an impartial clan message carrier and dispute mediator between clans. He does his best, okay, and he goes from clan to clan to try and settle all of these orcish feuds. Um, but he's he's freelance. 
So he doesn't get a lot of work. <laughs> so he just, he just... Oh, so he waits for someone to hire him. He doesn't just go in to settle disputes on his own. Well, he he could certainly try, but I'm pretty sure the orc tribes don't really want their disputes settled. Oh, uh, yes, that's they true. They kind of date the whole fighty stabby bit. Yeah, that's yeah. true. <laughs> so he's not very good at his job, I think. No, take he's it. really trying to sell himself. He's a hustler. Like, okay. he, he's out there. He's trying to hustle. He's saying, hey... Hire my services. I'm a great dispute mediator between your clans. So take us through this this narrative that you've concocted here. We've snuck into the village of a tidy group of goblins. They've made peace with a nearby human town and are developing their own resources. We know that they've kidnapped a classroom full of children, however. So we've snuck up to the wooden spiked walls of their fortress. They've made peace with the human town, but they've captured all of their children? That's kind of a dick move. They assume that the kids aren't really a crucial part of this town. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I mean, who needs kids? They don't do much. They're going to be doing a lot of summoning of other kids with those kids. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So we're outside the walls, and there's two guards on the wall with grotesque, swollen, bloodshot eyeballs. They spot us. They bring One of them brings a huge horn up to their lips, preparing to take a big breath. And then what do we cast? So we're just going to cast Polymorph. So the material components of Polymorph is just a single caterpillar cocoon? Yes. Okay. So you want to go first? Do you want me to take this one? Uh, I will venture a try. All right. So I am going to use Dothraki as my language. Excellent. My caster, while uttering Ensolat Kado. Nice. As he consumes the cocoon and he balls his fist while holding up his index finger and his middle finger and he uses it to trace a smooth action of a rabbit jumping down his arm (laughs) he just made a rabbit shadow puppet (laughs) (laughs) nice at the same time mcjaster is casting the same spell he's pursing his lips and crushing the cocoon into them then he blows the powder into the wind, saying the words, Yit ora yit, as he uses his hands to direct the wind to his target. Is that Ewakis? It is indeed. <laughs> He's using Ewakis. Nice. So the guards, their limbs pop into their bodies all at once, and they fall to the deck of the guard tower. Fur explodes everywhere as we see a groundhog and a rabbit. We're sneaking further in now, working our way through the tents and structures. There's a cave in the back where children can be heard asking for more gruel. There's a group of goblins led by a weirdly tall, skinny one with a sloppy head, <laughs> seemingly full of the fat that would normally be elsewhere on his body. Why does it have a sloppy head? <laughs> you know, goblins. That's such a disgusting That's descriptor sloppy, of a... Sloppy, bulbous heads. Ew. <laughs> like an overripe fruit. Ready to burst. Ew. <laughs> They're surrounding the gruel, these goblins, these sloppy goblins, and denying the hungry children... Why? It's literally gruel. Why do the children want this so much? How long have they been here? 30 minutes. <laughs> Kids are always hungry for gruel. Luckily, these goblins are crowded tightly around it, keeping the children back with pointed sticks. <laughs> it's really, like, is gruel a currency within these goblins? Like, why do they care so much about the gruel? What's well, all the food they have, besides the kids? <laughs> And then I want the kids getting that gruel stink on them. Okay. <laughs> All right. So what are we casting? To solve this problem, we're going to go ahead and cast Fireball, which for the material components is a tiny ball of bat guano and sulfur. Ah, uh, yes. The bat guano rears its ugly head again. Yes. Had All to right. get that in there. <laughs> okay. So lay your spell on me. He says the powerful Iwaki's phrase, Eklasis Fulu. And he takes a wow. brick of bat guano out of his bag and jams his hand right into it. A whole brick. A whole big old brick. <laughs> and it's a lot of bat shit. Yeah, he had to collect it for a while. A humming energetic sound is heard from the brick until most of it sloughs off to reveal just his index finger with a guano tip. He grabs his <laughs> <laughs> he grabs his wrist with his other hand and he aims it at his target. A beam of fiery energy pours forth culminating in a massive explosion of flame. Wow. So the language, again, Dothraki. And in Dothraki, we're using Vorsafiri. Powerful. Yes. And with a pinch of both in each hand, 
the bat guano and the sulfur. He's going to clap his hands together forcefully, and in doing so, his hands pulse outward as if trying to contain the growing energy between them. He then moves his hands around the surface of the glowing orb, which seems to bloat wherever his hands go until it's ready to be lobbed in the direction of his enemy. And Boomtown. Boomtown, fireball. Nice. These gruel hoarding goblins are quickly consumed by fire, running pell-mell and cursing and goblin as they succumb to the flames. The stink is awful. We put... <laughs> I can smell it. It's gross. <laughs> we quickly gather the children around us and tell them to stay quiet as we make our getaway. And to do that, we need to cast Pass Without Trace. Which And yeah, material components for that are what? Ashes from a burned leaf of mistletoe and a sprig of spruce. All right. So he says the magic words... As he tosses the ashes in the air and they hover as a small cloud in front of his face, he throws the spruce in and it floats in the air right in the middle of the little cloud. He then he then claps hard over the cloud and the clap is dead silent as the cloud Ooh. disperses over its targets. Nice. The little chillins are now deadly silent. All right. Let's Just see. This your th- worst fear. <laughs> <laughs> what? Silent children. Isn't that what everyone wants? Well... Unless they're up to no good, like stealing all your fucking gruel. Oh, I see. All right, so what do you got for me? All right, so the sprig is burned as the two spellcasters motion together the children near them, putting their small hands together tightly. My caster utters the words, Chak avos lagat, and the sprig silently burns and the ash mixes and it sprinkles to the backs of all of their hands after which they move their hands apart and not even their clothes make a whisper. Oh, sneaky silent. Our movements are most like as we escape the goblin compound and we make haste to return them to their town and their class. After our exit, the goblin leader comes out of his tent, looks around, and throws down his fancy bone hat in outrage, stomping on it with vigor. So let me get this straight. We returned the children back to their class, which is still congruent with the 30 minutes that they've been waiting for their gruel (laughs) so this hasn't been more than a couple hours this was like a field trip to the goblin camp well here's something the townspeople don't know we knew that the goblins were going to steal them and we in fact told them where to get them oh (laughs) so we sent the goblins to go steal the kids we're the teachers We just want a, a smoke break because these kids are a goddamn nightmare. Can you please take these children to your Oh, your Goblin place? King, please take these children. And if they ask for gruel, don't give it to them. <laughs> they will ask. All right, so we hope you enjoyed our theories and ideas around spell casting components. Maybe they can add a little bit more flavor to your games. Yeah, and as a beginner spell, go cast sleep on your cat. <laughs> that should be easy to start with. Well, that is the most unnecessary spell ever to be cast on a cat (laughs) as they are always sleeping. And if they're not, they're on the verge of being asleep. (laughs) Therefore, easy spell to cast. Don't go wake up your cat. (laughs) All right. uh, If you enjoyed this in any way, shape, or form, feel free to check out our website at hookandchance.com. Our Facebook, find us by the same name. Our Twitter, our Instagram. Same on Reddit, same on Patreon. <laughs> just cu- just type in the words hook and chance. You'll probably find us. Find us somewhere that you like. All right. We sure appreciate everyone's feedback and all of the reviews that you've been le- leaving, especially the very few Apple users that we have. Apparently, your reviews matter most. Um, <laughs> what a world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Apple, knock it off. But we love hearing from you, so keep the reviews coming. Keep the feedback coming. We love to hear anything you have to say about the show so thanks for listening and play what i mean (laughs) you really (laughs) fucked me up with that one play great games play great games